um, they not only diagnose the problem, but have uh, as prescriptions about um, how to deal with it uh, going forward. And that makes up uh, a good portion of the report and, and what we uh, will be able to discuss today. So um, the representatives uh, will uh, tell us what they discovered and uh, the way ahead and joining them in conversation is uh, our own Martin Rasser, who directs CNES's Technology and National Security Program. Martin's been running a study at CNES on critical supply chains and their implications for national security. So there'll be a lot to discuss here. And with that, let me turn it over to Martin to uh, begin the conversation. Great, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. So great that you could join us. And uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin and Congressman Mike Gallagher. Uh, welcome back to CNES. It's great to see you both. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, congratulations on this very comprehensive and timely report. Um, there's a lot in there, as Richard mentioned. It's both a sobering read, but at the same time, also a hopeful one, because you outlined a lot of key recommendations that I think will go a long way to addressing the vulnerabilities and the risks that we'll be discussing today. Um, so before we uh, dive into some of the, the content, I do want to remind our audience that you can be a part of the conversation. You can submit a question on cnes.org slash live, or if you prefer, you can tweet your question to us using the hashtag CNES2021. So let's dive right in. Um, let's start with uh, some of the context um, for the task force and the report. And specifically, I'd like to get your thoughts on how the, the COVID-19 pandemic really underscored the need to uh, reevaluate and address supply chain risks. Yeah, well, I'll kick us off. Um, and thanks to CNA and CNAS to hosting us. Thanks to Rich and thanks to my um, co-chair, Mike Gallagher. I think it's been a really positive bipartisan experience um, over the last three or four months to really dig into this issue. And I think, you know, we came together as a task force because of the pretty searing experience pretty much every member of Congress had through COVID in trying to get basic supplies, masks, gloves, gowns um, for our hospitals, for our frontline healthcare workers. And, you know, if, if I'm finding myself on the phone with a Chinese middleman in the middle of the night trying to negotiate to get a 78 cent mask, something has gone wrong in our supply chains. And I think the strategic context was, okay, you know, we've been globalized for 30 years and pushing that idea of, you know, kind of using the whole world to resource what we need here in the United States. And we either didn't know or we didn't care about the vulnerabilities. And along came uh, COVID and really exposed some of those vulnerabilities in a really intense way. Um, and we got to thinking, you know, it, if it exposed vulnerabilities on the commercial side, what would that mean for the defense supply chain? What would it mean if those vulnerabilities actually were dependencies, particularly on countries like China? How would that affect the decision making at the department who either could or would make decisions differently because of some of those dependencies? So it came from COVID-19 and you know the experience I think that we had on the commercial side and thinking about what that looked like on the defense side, and that it was a national security issue when you take it to the defense supply chains. Congressman Gallagher, any uh, any additional thoughts on that point? Well, first, uh, let me just echo the thanks for for having us. Um, you know, if it's uh, it's always a pleasure to be at CNAS, and if the CNAS offices are looking understaffed, uh, it's only because there's so many talented experts going into the Biden administration. So my congrats on that. And uh, thank you to um, uh, Alyssa Slotkin for her leadership. This task force would not have happened were it not. It was it was entirely her um, inspiration and uh, she pushed to make it happen and she was kind enough to include me and I, it was a really rewarding effort. You know, I just would um, foot stomp uh, what she said. I, the moment for me that crystallized the challenge ahead was when in the early stages of the pandemic, you had Chinese Communist Party officials threatening to cut off the export of advanced pharmaceutical ingredients in order to plunge America into a sea of coronavirus was the phrase that they used. And that was a real uh, wake up call. In addition to the general chaos of 
trying to determine who has testing reagent and where this widget comes from, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, as we approach this challenge, we spent a lot of time thinking about what actually constitutes critical uh, in the defense supply chain. Uh, what is the the limiting principle? Uh, and that that's a difficult thing to define because, of course, if everything is critical, th then nothing is critical. But I think you know, if you read through the report, you'll sense um, some areas where we, we arrived at an agreement uh, where we need to be doing more, where we're too vulnerable. Um, semiconductors is, is obvious, uh, but obviously that extends to rare earths, energetics, and and some other areas. So, um, you know, we're not trying to suggest we've we've solved everything. And in one 25-page uh, report, I do think we deserve extra credit for keeping the report uh, so short and focused uh, in contrast to many congressional and think tank efforts. Uh, but if nothing else, we hope to have begun the discussion with the Pentagon and nudged the Pentagon to move faster uh, and in a better direction. No, that's a great point. Actually, it is uh, not just uh, a, a relatively brief report, but it's also very well written. It's very digestible, which is great, right? Because that means that um, it's easily accessible for people and really to, to get to the gist of what really matters. And so what you do in this report, you lay out uh, six recommendations as legislative proposals for inclusion in the NDAA. Uh, so these would cover statutory requirements for supply chain risk management, auditing and diversification, bolstering human capital, enhancing international partnerships, uh, as well as enacting a comprehensive rare earths supply chain strategy. And then there's a whole bunch of other recommendations concerning industrial based issues, the Defense Production Act and workforce. And I think the the workforce aspect in particular is very interesting because I think that may not be intuitive for a lot of people as to how that fits into supply chain risk. So um, could you expand a bit on just the importance of America's talent pipeline and, and the role that plays in uh, ensuring secure supply chains? Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. You know, we had four Democrats, four Republicans on our task force. And within, I think, the first or second session, the issue of workforce came up so frequently um, from our witnesses, um, from the private sector, from from the public sector, that you can have, you know, a very resilient supply chain for stuff. But if you don't have skilled trades that can actually um, work and put things together, particularly here, it, it, you're just, it's a limiting factor on the supply chain. And so we um, uh, heard from a bunch of different industries about their workforce. And I think really felt like it was important to establish a coalition to have like a family conversation between industry groups, you know, defense and industrial base, education partners, the organizations who do apprenticeships really, really well, including unions, and just start the conversation more formally on what do we do to incentivize um, more people getting into the skilled trades, more people training in the fields that we know we need because we identified it as a limiting factor. Yeah, so for example, I um, I have a shipyard in my district, and so I've seen firsthand just the incredible investments that our shipyard has made um, in partnership with our local um, technical colleges, Northeast Wisconsin Technical College, Fox Valley Technical College, uh, to develop uh, their workforce. And this is a shipyard that's um, uh, uh, trying now to prepare to expand uh, by hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, you know. If you have such budgetary uncertainty with DOD, you're always at risk of losing these people that you've invested incredible amounts of money into, and you're not necessarily going to get them back. And that creates a real vulnerability at a time when we're trying to, um, you know, prepare ourselves to compete effectively with China. You know, my my other observation is that there there's a tendency, I think, in almost every sort of think tank report, whether it's on cyber or AI, to land on this position of, we need to invest in STEM, we need to do STEM, STEM. And similarly, we sort of arrive at that conclusion, but we also, if you look at the report, try to figure out, well, what are the actual uh, levers that DOD can pull to participate in the STEM conversation, leveraging things like the National Defense uh, Education Act, uh, leveraging the Office of Industrial Based Analytics and sustainment. Uh, so, you know, while this is a complex issue that involves, you know, local education, uh, state level entities, we tried to think, you know, where where do, where can DOD contribute to this uh, critical workforce issue? 
One of the uh, the things that I found uh, particularly useful about the report is that you uh, have summaries of all the discussions that in, informed the uh, the recommendations that you put forward. Um, one uh, one that jumped out at me was just the difficulty in auditing and understanding our supply chain. So when it comes to mapping supply chains, what what are some of the obstacles that uh, that people brought to your attention? Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, sir. Oh yeah, well you've been going first every time, so I figured I I, I need to pull my weight. Um, <laughs> well, I'd be curious if you agree with this. Uh, I, there was this moment. Well, there were a few moments, whether it was uh, interviewing um, Pentagon officials or interviewing industry representatives, where the response we got was, "Well, we simply can't. We can't do it. I mean, it's you know, we 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 can't even go a layer down, let alone uh, two layers down." And it was. Uh, Chairwoman Slotkin, who continually reminded us that that's just not an acceptable answer. So I think there's a certain inertia, a certain status quo bias, and uh, a shared sense that this is such an impossible task, informed perhaps by um, past uh, uh, sector by sector, tier by tier uh, failures um, that we need to overcome within DOD, particularly as technology, I think, has opened up uh, the opportunity uh, to actually figure this out. And, you know, we met with a CEO of a, an AI company who talked about the ways in which they're leveraging AI in order to do effective mapping. We met with another a former Trump administration official who suggested, OK, this is a difficult issue. It may not, you're not going to fix it overnight. Um, but one thing you might be able to do is pick a legacy program and just map the heck out of that legacy program and figure out what you learn from that process and then iterate based on that. So I think we're dealing with a variety of, of, of issues here, but I, I give Alyssa credit for, for just not accepting uh, um, no as an answer. Yeah, we, we definitely heard from you know the department and from industry that, listen, this is really hard and um, you know some, some reluctance. From others we heard, of course, well, it's just gonna cost money, right? So be aware that you're, it's gonna be another sort of um, charge um, to the account. I, I do think if you can figure out how to pay your tier two and tier three suppliers, you can probably figure out how to map them. Um, but I know that's controversial with the defense industrial base. Um, I will say, you know, I guess we're all prisoner to our own experience. And I happen to be in a district that represents two GM plants, one of which has been shut down on and off for weeks because we can't get a 14 cent microchip. Um, and we have thousands of cars literally sitting there in parking lots that we've rented from Michigan State University just to store them um, because we can't, you know, make the airbags work without that microchip. So GM has been really, you know, forced to really dig in and figure out their supply chains and map them and get more predictable and figure out where those vulnerabilities are. And I feel like, you know, if if they're doing that amount of work because they can't get cars out, shouldn't we be doing at least basic work if it's about whether our planes are ready to fight tonight? I mean, the consequences are so much more serious in the defense supply chain um, than in the, the commercial sector. So um, I, I, I heard those concerns, um, but we, we got to push through a little bit because you know this idea that we don't know the vulnerabilities until they're creeping up on us, you know, imagine that, particularly with China. And just imagine that scenario. Play it out. You know, we're we're things are we're in a limited escalation with China, and they make all the propellant for our ammo. I don't know. I don't think it, we were missing the irony that we might not be able to engage if we needed to because they provide all the propellant. Um, I don't want our leaders to be prisoner to that kind of. Um, vulnerability, but you can't fix that unless you know about the vulnerability. So that's what we're asking for. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, okay, it's difficult now. Uh, you think it's going to get any easier if we're uh, scrapping over Taiwan? Uh, no, let's figure it out in peacetime so that we don't find ourselves on the losing side during wartime. So there's a lot of um, discussion in the report about working with allies and like-minded partners. Um, in particular, uh, you cite the phrase ally and friend shoring, uh, which I believe is a phrase that uh, the, the Biden administration used in their supply chain EO. Uh, 
Can you explain what, what that might look like in, in a supply chain context, how we would work with allies and partners to address some of these supply chain diversification and resilience issues? Go ahead, Mike. This is, this is Mike's baby. I have to give Mike all the credit. This is like from day one, he's been like allies and partners, allies and partners. And of course, a good Wisconsin member and a good Michigander always want everything to be made in the Midwest where it should be made. But being realistic, um, Mike has really been a leader on this concept. So over well, that's way. very nice of you to say. I ju it has just been my observation. Well, we we did we deal with the complexities of Buy America provisions right now, particularly in the shipbuilding industries. And there are certain things where uh, I think it's actually counterproductive to domestic industry. I think right now at, at a time when, when there is genuine bipartisan energy behind onshoring manufacturing, that's all well and good. We, we have to recognize what is our, our, I think, asymmetric advantage relative to the Chinese Communist Party, which is just this incredible network of allies, friends, and partners that we've built up painstakingly over the last few decades. And then if you really get to the core of that network, um, you know, I really think it is within, it starts with the Five Eyes Alliance, um, you know, uh, the Brits, the Aussies, the Kiwis, uh, even the Canadians. Um, and uh, we've we've come up with some, some frameworks in recent years, particularly the national technological industrial base. We formally incorporated Australia into our national technological industrial base two NDAAs ago. The Brits were already part of NTIB, as it's called. Uh, but what we, what we quickly learned in talking with our allies, in talking with industry, is that while this concept is a, a valuable one and our, our closest allies welcome it, it hasn't really amounted to much in practice, right? And so part of what we're recommending is using the existing NTIB framework and really figuring out a way to put some meat on the bones uh, of the NTIB. I think there was a, a general consensus from everyone we talked to that NTIB has promised, but it's being underutilized right now. And I would just say, finally, I mean, for me, a part of this, my, why I was so keen to explore the NTIB was just the experience we had over the last five years with Huawei and ZTE. You know, I think we did a pretty good job, both Congress and the administration, going around the world, talking to our partners and saying, don't do business with Huawei and ZTE. Huawei and ZTE are bad, 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 bad. Like we just play defense, right? We did not do a good job of going on offense and figuring out in concert with our allies, okay, how are we gonna pool our collective resources to you know, develop 5G alternatives that can compete with Huawei and ZTE, not just on quality and OPSEC, but on price. To me, that is the, if we are going to contemplate some form of selective economic and financial decoupling from China, which I think is now inevitable, the only way that works is if we simultaneously draw closer with our partners and our allies and collaborate on critical technologies. Easier said than done, but that's at least sort of the general intent of those allied recommendations in the final report. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very similar discussion that we've been having at the CNES roundtables on supply chain vulnerabilities. You know, really focusing on that multilateral component, what we can best do in concert to to make this whole uh, supply chain remapping process more efficient, more time effective. Um, uh, Jackson, uh, who's one of our um, uh, audience members, has a question that that is related to this. Um, so he specifically would like to know what technologies need to be reshored for DOD capabilities. So where we really want the United States to essentially be self-sufficient um, in specific areas. Um, what kind of uh, areas do you see as being uh, top of the list in your mind for, for that type of uh, adjustment? Well, this is getting to the problem that Mike mentioned about sort of how do you define critical? And then how do you make sure that that's not static and stuck, you know, in cement and that you allow the department to identify with the framework what is critical and then go deep on those particular critical supply chains, knowing that it could change. We went through semiconductors, rare earth elements, propellants and pharmaceuticals on the sort of low end of things. I think there's been a lot of talk about semiconductors and, and chips and, and rare earth elements. But I think what we figured out was there's some pretty high-end things that are critical to almost everything the department does, 
there's some pretty low end things that could really hamper us if we couldn't get our hands on them. You know, think about what would happen to the forest if we had a shortage of antibiotics. Imagine what would happen if we couldn't get insulin, right? There are some things, particularly as Puerto Rico has lost a lot of its industry after the hurricane that we really realized, you know, that's a, it's a, uh, not something you think about, but it's a supply chain issue that we want the department to be thinking about. So um, I, I would say we have our, our best stab, um, but we didn't want to overly constrain the department. I just want to know that they're looking at this, they have a framework, and then they are racking and stacking, stacking where we are really truly dependent. You know, the, we had some, some department briefers come over and brief us and anyone who knows the department knows they love a stoplight chart. You know, red, yellow, and green. Green is good, yellow is all right, red is bad. And it looked at um, where we get propellant. And um, it was a lot of red. I mean, they just held up the chart from a distance and you could see red. Um, luckily, they identified that they had they they had folks within the department did the right thing and moved out. Um, but those are we took our stab at a first list. But I'm open to the department coming up with a, a different list. They just got to have a list. Yeah, I think I think uh, you know we're we're not suggesting with these sort of four areas that this is an exhaustive list uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But given the constraints of time uh, for our work. And given that our overall objective was to identify areas where we can really impact this year's NDAA cycle, this we thought was at least the foundation or the start of a list of this. This seemed to be the areas where both the department, uh, members in Congress who are tracking this and the think tank community and outside experts and in industry seem to think this is the, at least in these four areas is where we have uh, have a problem. So perhaps over time, we'll arrive at a larger list. Perhaps the list gets smaller in certain areas. But we thought this was a good start, if nothing else. No, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question from Maxwell. Um, Maxwell is interested to know what does the future of government and private industry collaboration and regulation look like in the wake of uh, the supply chain vulnerabilities that we're experiencing now? Mike, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, part of what we're trying to do in the report is to foster uh, a greater uh, collaboration. Um, you know, and part of what we're talking about with mapping uh, the supply chain and forcing industry to go a few layers deep is to make them aware of their own vulnerabilities and ultimately get to a point where they're proactively informing uh, DOD about areas where uh, we're we're vulnerable and need to do a little bit more. Uh, as I look at this, and maybe I'm getting outside of the work of the report a little bit here, but I think it's fair to say that part of the problem here is that our defense industrial base has grown uh, brittle and um, uh, solidified uh, over time. I see this particularly pronounced in shipbuilding, um, just based on the number of yards we have uh, in America today. It's precipitously declined. Uh, it's sort of coincided with the a decline of, of commercial shipbuilding. And I think that creates a vulnerability. So ultimately where I'd like to see us go over time, and again, this is much more long-term than what the report contemplates, is to have a more competitive and diversified defense industrial base that you know isn't just dominated by five prime companies, but has a healthy emergence of a bunch of other uh, companies and a healthy culture of collaboration between uh, the public sector and the private sector. We just can't, you know, I, I think it, what we're contemplating is some form of industrial policy here, but we're never going to out industrial policy China, right? It's just not going to happen. That's not our relative strength. We have to find a way to have a more collaborative approach where we're harnessing the entrepreneurship and the innovation that naturally exists in the private sector. I believe that's one of our relative advantages over our, our, our biggest competitor. Yeah, and I, I would just say, you know, we, we created a recommendation around this that just asked for industry and the department and other players to sort of form a coalition. We didn't want to be overly prescriptive, um, um, but I do think it's about getting around a table and actually having a conversation with all the stakeholders there. Everyone's talking about supply chains right now. It's very popular. You know, everybody's doing their own report, their own thing. And we tried to learn from as many folks who have done it um, 
uh, already. But um, the truth is, you really need the the key stakeholders at a table. And you know, again, this goes beyond the report. But in my mind, um, you know. We have things like the Defense Science Board. We have these boards that the that the Defense Department um, pulls together, and you know I think it's interesting to think about a defense manufacturing board. You know to think about you know if not a permanent board, just starting that conversation. And then once we do it nationally, we really, to Mike's point, need to do it internationally. You know, I was at the Pentagon, and we had a NATO meeting about everything. I mean, we talked about every weedy detail, um, and I don't remember ever once hearing about a supply chain conversation at NATO, even though so many of our NATO allies are having the same problems, identifying the same dependencies. So let's do it. Let's have that conversation. Um, but we got to get everyone around the table. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um I want to talk about data. There's a line in in the report that I found very interesting, right? So it's a, a recap of one of your meetings, and it states that data emerged as a critical component of a supply risk mitigation, uh, supply chain risk mitigation strategy. Um, particularly pointing out that two panelists emphasized the value of data as a commodity to protect, analyze, and develop. And uh, Jason has a question along these lines. So he specifically asking how we can leverage the defense intelligence enterprise to provide more information to the defense industrial base about supply chain threats. Um, I'd love to, to get your thoughts on that particular point because a mismatch of uh, data needs and uh, data sources um, is a big problem. Uh, how did the task force tackle this particular issue? Well, I, I'm not sure we we came up with a solution to that specific problem. Correct me if I'm wrong, Alyssa. I, it's not coming to mind in our, our final recommendations. I come from the defense intelligence world, though I was not a, a data uh, geek. I was a human intelligence guy. So I, I dealt with uh, with human beings and not zeros and ones. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I, 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 it's not necessarily something that we um, were able to figure out in our final report unless I'm missing something very big, Alyssa. I apologize. No, it's it's you're you're not missing anything big. I do think we talked about data um, in the context of you know watching Chinese capital invest in yeah. some of the defense companies or the the, the startups um, that were having some of the the best ideas in the country um, and concerned about what they would do with the data. And especially if those companies, let's say in Silicon Valley, were getting defense contracts, what kind of rules of the road were there for Chinese access to that data? So I think um, I think we talked about it, uh, I hate to say this, we probably admired the problem more than we um, actually came up with a solution. Um, and I, I would think there'd be some great CNAS researchers um, or folks out there who could really dig into this because it, it is an issue, um, but I'm not going to pretend that we solved it. Could I riff on that for a second? And let me caveat this by saying I am now going far afield from the report. So I do not speak for uh, the gentle lady from Michigan when I say this. But if you look at the last five years, one of the biggest things we did was to scrutinize, as, as Alyssa talks about, Chinese investments in the United States. This culminated in a piece of legislation called FIRMA. It was a, a revision, uh, a reform of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. We basically gave CFIUS a lot more authorities. For example, they could now scrutinize Chinese buying up real estate near, uh, near military bases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this was Chinese investments coming to the United States. We might wanna scrutinize those more closely. And oh, by the way, Chinese companies that are trying to list on our exchanges need to, at a minimum, comply with the same PCAOB requirements that we force U.S. businesses to. We passed a piece of legislation that does that. It's sort of time delayed two years, but all of this was an attempt to make sure that we're scrutinizing uh, Chinese capital being deployed domestically in the United States. I think that the next phase of this is going to be, and where CN CNIS could do a lot of good, is to scrutinize the outflow of US capital to Chinese technology companies in general and data companies uh, in particular, um, because that outflow has increased even amidst the pandemic. And we have 
American money being invested in companies that are on this thing called the CCMC list, the Communist Chinese Military Company list, which is the list we demanded in an NDAA 20 years ago, and we didn't get until last year. So I actually think there's going to be a framework that emerges that basically says all of these companies are off limits. We don't want American pension funds. Uh, we don't want uh, university endowments uh, being used to build things that are designed to kill Americans in a future war or enslave Uyghur Muslims in a modern day concentration camp. So that's my little plug for for maybe work we can do in the future together. No, absolutely. I think outbound investment screening is an area uh, in need of a lot of attention and analysis because, yeah, to your point, there's uh, there's significant vulnerabilities that we're foisting upon ourselves just by where and how we're investing U.S. dollars. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, a lot of room for, for follow up there. Um, uh, Michael has a question uh, which essentially uh, goes to recommendation three, and that's the need to reduce reliance on adversaries for resources and manufacturing. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about what the discussion was like on that particular point? And I think uh, China in particular here uh, would have loomed very large, but I'd be interested to hear what uh, the discussion was like about countries like Russia, for example. Well, Mike will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't, I don't didn't remember a ton of stuff coming out of Russia um, that we were dependent on. Um, but um, but China obviously was the focus of attention. That said, there were a lot of folks who came in who were talking about their concern over over sole sourcing in general. Right. It could be Indonesia. It could have been Vietnam. It could have been somewhere else, um, India. And that risk of sole source, you know, we, we were doing our task force right in the middle of when the pandemic was really hitting India super hard. And it wasn't a, a malicious or a nefarious slowdown that was happening. It was literally a public health based slowdown that was um, causing an impact here in the United States for those who were just solely invested in getting their supply from one country. So I think diversification was the name of the game, but there was no way around um, us, I mean, from day one, we were talking about China in particular um, and the, oh, the Venn diagram of how much we get from China um, and um, and how many things we only get from China was intensely. Um, it was strong. It was strong. And and um, I, this is where, you know, we started, again, sort of brainstorming scenarios um, of what would happen um, if we, you know, had to get into a conflict, uh, even a limited escalation with them, and how they could impact us. Um, and it just, it didn't take a lot of creativity. It doesn't take a Hollywood screenwriter to figure out why this would be, um, this would be dangerous. So it, almost every day or every session that we had, we were talking about what this would mean in the Chinese context. And um, while I do feel like we're seeing China and the United States just sort of realize this interdependency and sort of pull away from it a little bit, it's going to take a long time, um, even just on the critical things to sort of extricate ourselves or diversify our supply chains. It's not going to be overnight by any means, but it just was the topic of almost every session we had. In our and in in um, uh, recommendation three, which you alluded to, what we're basically saying is we need an, an iterative process and a statutory requirement where we tell DoD identify all the areas where we are we are reliant on a single source adversarial nation. And so perhaps DOD comes back to us and says, it's China here, here, here. Oh, there's this thing in Russia we just figured out. And, you know, I, can ima I can't imagine what Iran would be or, or North Korea, but, you know, you get the idea. And then Congress on an annual basis is able to look at that list and that stimulates a productive discussion between the Armed Services Committee and uh, Pentagon leadership. That's at least what we're after. We're not presuming to have developed the the uh, the comprehensive list ourselves. Got it. OK, great. Thank you for that. So um, we have uh, two questions that came in pertaining to rare earth elements, which is the uh, the sixth recommendation uh, that you make. And um, so Alex is asking um, how we can build up domestic RE 
processing capacity without risking China shutting off our current supply. And Sam, um, you know, has a similar question. So he observes that in the final year of the previous administration, a number of investments were made to look at the domestic sourcing of key minerals, such as pilot plants for processing rare earth elements. Uh, what are your thoughts on a domestic mining and processing capabilities for REE? Well, one point to remember. Oh, sorry, I'll just something quick here, Alyssa. Yeah. Is that it's it's it, it's almost it's a little bit of a misnomer to call rare earths rare earths because the problem isn't necessarily that they're rare. It's just that our ability to extract them and then process them is 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 rare just because we've we've gotten comfortable with uh, relying on on China. So, you know, for example, I always think I think Japan had a huge discovery of rare earths in their territorial waters in 2011, I wanna say. And then of course, in Western Australia, they have uh, you know, incredible refining and, and mining capacity and expertise that we could tap into. So it's sort of just a matter of, again, getting it, the, that allied cooperative framework right. Um, and I think also, you know, DOD has invested some time and money into um, uh, rare earth partnerships in recent years. Uh, we need to monitor those, we need to learn the right lessons from those, understand if those are models that we can build upon, potentially invest more money into, you know, rare earth processing uh, plants in Green Bay, Wisconsin, for example, just to name one potential location for it, um, or figure out if, it, if it's not actually uh, solving the problem going forward. And then I would also say, I think what's important is that we were obviously looking at the defense supply chains, but if we're gonna talk about the vulnerabilities and, and the risks, for instance, of China shutting off access to rare earth elements, um, it's important to step out of just the defense box and realize kind of the very, very sophisticated back and forth we have with them and their dependencies on us. You know, for sure, we have a dependency on rare earth elements from them, and they get 30% of their food from us. So it's not just a defense lane. Um, you know, if you've got a defense wonk who's looking at this, we have to look at the vulnerabilities they have as well and not assume that they could just turn off the light switch without us also being able to um, induce some pain if we needed to. Now, um, if we don't, if we don't use those tools and we're not willing to pull those levers, you know. Americans tend to be kind of, well, we have economic issues and we have military issues and, and cultural issues and, and they're separate. And I feel like the Chinese are better at kind of playing the game and using all the tools. Um, and I think we have to get better at that. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, I wanna understand what we can do on rare earth elements, but I also wanna better understand their dependencies on us to eat. Um, because I think we're gonna have to use those carrots and sticks and in a deft way, you know, potentially in the next decade. No, that's a great point, right? Because the United States, of course, has considerable leverage over China as well. And that's something that we need to look at and, and think about how how we exert that leverage in a way that uh, that meets our strategic interests. Um, what I what I really liked about the uh, the rare earths recommendation is that, you know, you went beyond just saying, well, let, we need to expand processing and mining in other parts of the world, including the United States, but you also focused on America's innovative capabilities, right? So coming up with just better techniques to do that mining and processing, but also uh, looking farther to better recycling techniques and perhaps even um, over the very long term, uh, maybe man-made substitutes for rare earth elements. How much of um, that the discussion in all your meetings was about looking at innovative solutions, um, technology-based solutions to some of these problems that we have, whether it's in rare earth, uh, using um, you know, rare earth elements, uh, improvements there, or, or looking to techniques uh, in synthetic biology, for example, to address supply chain vulnerabilities. So I'll start um, and then hand to Mike. We didn't, we didn't spend a ton of time going through all the different options, the different alternatives, but I think what was always there underlying all of our sessions was we are a democracy, we are a big bureaucratic system and they are not. Their advantage is they can move quickly, make decisions quickly, they don't have the rules and regulations that we have. Um, um, but if done right, we have the best new ideas in the world and we should be putting those to use. That's our competitive advantage. 
Um, and the, this came up on the environmental issues, right? I mean, mining is messy. And um, I think this is where it just, you know, imagining any of us doing, you know, a, an extensive mining project in our state is going to be different than the mining op operations set up in China. And how do we sort of push our companies to come up with technology that would help us um, uh, surpass those those problems, those environmental problems? I think that's a that was a big deal. We also heard from a participant who talked about the extensive work that the Chinese do on recycling microchips and how um, we do not do that. Well, that's interesting, right? If you can recycle and not have to mine as much um, to get the, you know, just to, to build new microchips, what would that look like in the United States? How do we push our industry to look at that? And then of course, we were writing this report while the Senate was taking up the CHIPS Act, while there was an active conversation bipartisan conversation about incentivizing the semiconductor industry um, to really set up in the United States in a more robust way. So um, underlying everything was that we're gonna have to, in some cases, find alternative and new ways to do the things that China does very cheaply and easily. Yeah, just quick on, you mentioned synthetic biotech. There's there's not a ton of discussion on that in the final report, but my, my own view is that, um, advances in synthetic biotech could ignite a an economic revolution whose impact will be greater than the industrial revolution. I mean, we have some American companies, Ginkgo BioWorks comes to mind, which are doing incredible things, printing organisms. We actually have an inherent advantage given sort of the biodiversity that naturally exists in the United States. I mean, if we were to, for example, have a concerted effort to uh, collect and catalog uh, and pool uh, with our free world allies, uh, sort of all that that uh, biological code that naturally exists, uh, that would be a cool thing. Again, I'm speaking outside uh, the report, but I think what you do see in the report is a a consistent commitment to increasing federal uh, research and development uh, dollars, which I just think, I mean, it you know, it, it's going to be critical for any technology of the future. You sort of map the share of federal dollars going to R and D over time. It's far below what we invested during the Cold War. Uh, it needs to increase separately. I have a piece of legislation called the Endless Frontiers Act, which is geared towards uh, really dramatically increasing our investment in R&D. And so I think there's a widespread recognition that as you know, Alyssa pointed out, as a democracy, we're not sort of here to say this company does X and you must do Y and we're, you know, we know exactly what the technology of the future is gonna be, but I think the federal government can play a more constructive role in funding research and development for those technologies of the future and also setting the standards, right? Part of the reason why we need to be so engaged in a variety of international fora so that when it comes time to map the rules of the road for how uh, synthetic biotechnology can be used and how it should not be weaponized in various areas, uh, the free world is, is, is writing those rules, not the Chinese Communist Party. And I would just be remiss if I didn't say that when we're talking about using our competitive advantage, it requires us to continue to improve the acquisition process for the department. Yeah. Like all of this is contingent on us figuring out how to get the best new companies, the best new ideas across the Valley of Death and into the department. And there's a lot that goes into that. That's a whole separate conversation, but it is, re it is very important that acquisition conversation, that culture conversation to supply chain vulnerabilities. Yeah, excellent point. Um, we have a question on multilateralism from Sam. Um, so Sam says, uh, you mentioned Five Eyes and current NTIB members earlier in the discussion. Can you discuss other techno democracies we should be engaging and possibly bringing into the NTIB or engaging with groups such as the Democracy 10, uh, which is, uh, for, for those who don't know, that's a group that uh, the British government proposed, um, basically the G7 countries, uh, along with India and a couple of others. Well, my, my again, my own view, and, and this is some work uh, that we did in NDAA four years ago, I want to say, was to try and get the Pentagon to assess whether Five Eyes could become Six Eyes, and the sixth country would be Japan. Uh, I think that's uh, an obvious country where we need to turbocharge our technological cooperation, Taiwan as well, uh, 
is uh, but just given the dominant role that TSMC plays in the semiconductor industry is an obvious choice, uh, as well as certain Scandinavian countries, uh, given just the role that Nokia and Ericsson play in the 5G debate, um, you know, Finland, Sweden, uh, Norway, countries like that. Uh, beyond that, I'd, I'd have to do a little bit more work in mapping out what others, including um, Jared Cohen at Google, have, have called, I think, the T the T12 or, or the T10, um, whatever the framework is, uh, I think there is a recognition that we need to be um, doing a better job of, of cooperating with our, our, our closest allies. And I didn't mean to suggest that we should just limit it to, to five eyes. I do, however, think the huge opportunity right now is a, a gold standard free trade agreement with the UK post Brexit that could specify some of these uh, ways in which we're gonna uh, cooperate uh, technologically and set a high standard for what a free and fair trade agreement looks like. Again, that's outside the report. I'm sorry, uh, but. No, it's good, right? Because this report is serving as a springboard for a broader conversation. And I think that's you know one of the, the great benefits of, of publishing a report like this. Um, I want to uh, dig deeper on uh, a specific section. So there's a, a whole series of recommendations relating to the Defense Production Act. Uh, which I think up until you know pretty recently, uh, a lot of people didn't even know what the DPA was. Um, so perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what the Defense Production Act is, why it exists, and how you envision it being used in the context of uh, supply chain resilience. Yeah, um, I'll start. I mean, I feel like the COVID experience made DPA kind of a household name, um, and certainly among national security types, everyone knows the DPA. Um, and it was really important. I mean, Michigan companies jumped into action on ventilators um, because the DPA was invoked and it helped um, all the tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers. It, it sort of forces them to prioritize the effort that's being tasked by the federal government as opposed to going in order um, of the orders they received um, uh, when it comes to a certain bolt or a certain part. So it was super important when we thought the whole world was gonna need um, so many ventilators. Um, and um, I think that it worked well for what we needed and is a really great tool to explore, um, you know, kind of tweaks that would make it even more effective for this conversation. And so what we basically said was, um, hey, it, it, it requires a presidential determination, right? It required President Trump at the time to sign off on it. We thought that that could probably be devolved to the Secretary of Defense, right? That there are, uh, that it's, that's a very high threshold to say that the President of the United States has to invoke it. The SECDAF is probably senior enough. And then again, based on the COVID experience, we thought we could give it more of an interagency utility by allowing general transfer authority from other agencies so that you know you would permit transfer of funds um, into the DPA. So if, for instance, the National Institute, Institutes of Health, HHS, I mean, whatever, that others could not have to recreate the wheel, but just be like, hey, Secretary of Defense, I am in desperate need of personal protective equipment you all can invoke the DPA and get more gowns made in the United States. We need them over at the NIH. We're going to use this general transfer authority to provide our money to use your authority. It's not rocket science. And I think those two tweaks on the DPA would make it, make it super effective and, and also just more strategic um, on those areas, again, that are critical where we're so dependent on other countries, particularly China. We, the, the Secretary of Defense can say, oh, Lord, you know, this hasn't made the headlines, but I see a vulnerability um, sole source to China on, you know, X. And I'm going to go ahead and start mitigating that now. Um, I think there's real possibility in this kind of area of the report. Congressman Gallagher, any uh, thoughts on that point on the DPA? I I thought um, Alyssa captured it very mm. well. And I, I don't know if she mentioned it, but so one of our things involves uh, eliminating the, uh, there's a $50 million cap yes. for certain yes. DPA yes. funds as well. So just small, I think we're looking at the, DPA is a very powerful tool. We've all become well acquainted with it uh, in the last uh, year. How do we tweak it uh, so that it's a more flexible tool, particularly when we're dealing with supply chain crises? 
We have uh, time for about uh, one more question, I think. And this one is from Andrew Everston, who's a reporter for C4 ISR Net. Uh, Andrew would like to know, how do you sell the supply chain mapping to industry? Does the DOD need to financially assist suppliers in this effort? Well, I mean, my simple uh, response is, we're, we're now telling DOD that we need to do a better job of mapping supply chain. That's part one of the simplest takeaways of this report. I would expect continued legislation from the Armed Services Committee. Uh, that's, that reinforces that message. So my hope is that industry takes notice, uh, starts to improve the tools which with, with which they're able to help DOD map the supply chain, and then potentially, you know, those companies can compete for future awards from uh, from DOD for the most effective uh, tools, automated or otherwise, uh, for for mapping uh, supply chain. So. I don't know if that answers the question or I, I don't think there's a need for DOD right now to say like, here's a hundred million dollars for the specific capability, but we're just trying to send the signal right now that this is a very important thing uh, and we're not, we're not getting the job done right now. Okay. Um, one final question for you. Now that uh, the report is out and you can reflect back on, on the past three months, is there anything that, that stood out, anything that surprised you, something you learned that you hadn't really thought of before or some an issue that you're looking at differently now that you've uh, gone through this whole process? Well, want me to start and you can close no, since yeah. you're the, you're out, you outrank me. Um, well, I would say this is, this is an area where maybe I revised my prior. I think it's fair to say that I came in with a bias that was we have to focus almost exclusively on the high end. What are the things we need in a no kidding conventional or somewhat subconventional conflict with the PLA over Taiwan? That's sort of the prism through which I view most things. Um, I think what, what uh, Alyssa convinced me of is that at times the distinction between the high and the low end is, is very opaque. And it does, as she pointed out earlier in this discussion, create a real vulnerability to the force if they can't get antibiotics uh, if they're if if China controls the supply of of APIs. If so, there I think there's a lot of thinking that needs to be done on connecting the low end to the high end. And again, you get to this very complex conversation of where do you draw the line, right? We can't we can't onshore everything. You know, DD can't pay for everything. Um, but how are we thinking about the interplay between the high and the low end? And again, I think that that's sort of the most difficult part of this idea of selective decoupling. It's like of course, I want Wisconsin farmers to sell soybeans to China. I don't care if Wisconsinites buy T-shirts from China, but where, what's the? There's a lot of things in between there that get a, a very gray. So that's an area where I just I was forced to to think differently than how I came into this discussion. If that makes sense. Yeah, and I think for me, um, it was it was you know once I started to really understand how hard this issue is if you don't tackle it corporately. Meaning, you know, something that the Defense Department is is very hard as someone who was at the Pentagon is you have each service, you have each component who's looking at their own kind of universe. And, um, and you, you kind of see how very quickly you can rob Peter to pay Paul on a bunch of these critical items and how much more efficient it is if you could look DOD wide at these things. Now, this is something that's extremely hard to do. Um, and we had the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Cap Hicks, come in and um, and I don't, I don't question for a second how difficult that ask is, but if we don't tackle it corporately, right, from, from her perch or the Secretary of Defense level, then you know, you'll, you'll kind of have each component realizing that they have these dependencies and they have a problem. Um, and um, the 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 push, I think, for the department to to do what it doesn't like to do, which is to look at this in a global way, for me, kind of the, the aha moment, the light bulb came on during the task force, for sure. All right. Well, that is an excellent note to end on. Uh, Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, Congressman Mike Gallagher, thank you so much for being here today. 
Really appreciate uh, the questions from all our participants. They were excellent. And I also want to give a special shout out to my CNES colleagues, uh, Shai Corman, uh, Jasmine Butler, Anna Peterson, and Henry Wu. Thank you all very much for making uh, this event a success. Um, we will see you all very soon. Take care, everyone, and see you next time. Thanks so much to CNAS and everybody else. Thanks, Thank Mike. Have a good one.